to Chapter 201 of the Town Charter, Section 9036 and 9061. Uh, I'll recognize Jody Shea. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. To be honest, it feels awkward to me um, to stand here and defend myself against the charge of incompetence. I am not incompetent. Taking a stance on an issue which some may disagree with does not mean I am incompetent. Making an unpopular policy decision does not equate to incompetence. In fact, it is quite the opposite. As elected officials, we know decisions we make won't be supported 100% of the time by 100% of the people, and that's okay. Our job is to make the best decision we can with the information and understanding we have at the time. So I again say you can disagree with my vote or a policy that I support, but that does not make me incompetent. I am confident in the decisions we as a board have made over the four and a half years that I've been on the board. I haven't always been on the winning side of a vote, um, but we govern as a body and I stand by the decisions that we have made to move this school district forward to becoming the best that it can be. I remember one of my first school board meetings, a group of students came to present to us from the Ecos Club, and they were amazing. They came in front of the board, presented a flaw they saw in our services, our cafeteria served non-recyclable trays. Um, they presented the problem, offered solutions and ideas, and thanked us for the opportunity to share their concerns. The board could have listened to their concerns, thanked them for coming, and moved along. But we didn't because anyone who gets involved in small town government does so to improve the community they live in. Well, I'm proud to say we were able to make the switch to recyclable trays and our students were the reason why it was even a possibility. This example may seem trivial to some, but for me it illustrates why I chose to run for the school board. I am passionate about our schools, I am hopeful of our students, and I look to work together with them and, and others to find solutions to move this district forward. I started out volunteering my time at Blue Point School where my daughter attended and quickly became involved in the PTA. I later, later became PTA president, which oversees the fundraising for all three primary schools in town. While president, I created Race to the Point 5K. It quickly became the largest fundraiser and a huge community event that still happens today eight years later. From there, I worked with the former superintendent and a handful of other citizens to form the Scarborough Education Foundation, where I served as secretary and vice president. That was a huge undertaking, but I am proud of the success CEF has had over the years, especially as budgets are tight. CEF offers our teachers and staff a chance to invest in innovative and creative ideas through grants. Some of these grants sparked investments by the district after a successful trial period. 3D printers, tablets for a reading program, the ever popular ukulele club, um, and a lot more. <laughs> Which brings me to my time on the school board. After starting up and serving on SEF, I decided to run for the board. I've been thoroughly enjoyed my time on the board. I've learned a lot. I have served as the finance chair, most recent uh, finance committee, most recently as chair, the communications committee. I've worked with the business and school partnership when it first started out a few years ago. I've been the liaison for the C for our CTE programs. <coughs> I'm currently service, serve, serving on the Health and Safety Committee with school and town leaders. And I've served on the Policy Committee and I am currently the Vice Chair of the Board. We all wear many different hats over the course of a term and it helps provide balance to the full board as committee members change and evolve. While I don't have a formal background in education or teaching, I have a marketing degree, um, I think that's what makes the school board a highly functioning board a diverse background of members. But what we all have is a strong desire to move our school district forward to be better, to make education for all students a priority, to provide opportunities for our students, uh, for the students in Scarborough to flourish and do better than the people before them, to provide continued growth for our teachers and to make sure our students leave high school with the education they deserve, are proud of, and this community is proud of. So although the seven board members may have a variety of backgrounds, having that same goal of serving all students and making Scarborough schools better and a real source of pride for our whole community is what we strive for every day. To get involved for any other reason doesn't serve our students or our teachers. Thank you. Public comment. Anyone wishing to speak, uh, please line up. 
Thank you. Jackie Perry. Jackie Perry, 215 Black Point Road, and I am a member of the Board of Education. I spoke earlier on Donna's behalf. I'm now going to tell you that with Jody and Carrie, we have the future of Scarborough's education sitting opposite me, and they are very good at what they do. A couple of things you're not aware of. Number one, you, people have said that the teachers wanted to meet with the Board of Education. Board of Education cannot collectively meet with any group. Three members of the Board of Education could meet with the teachers if the teachers requested it. Or the teachers could come to a Board of Education meeting and ask to be on the agenda. That's number one. Number two. This Board of Education member, when she found out about the recall, immediately sent an email to the sender of the letter saying, put me on there. I stand beside them and I stand behind them. And if you're going to recall them, recall me because you want to know something and nobody has heard this except the Board of Education, the superintendent and our lawyer. I said, lock him out send him home, put in an uh, interim principal, and do it now, because we don't need what's coming down the road. And our lawyer said, Jackie, you can't do that. I said, we'll pay whatever it takes. Let him sue, but get him out of town. I said that. Nobody else on the board. Come after me. Don't come after them. They're our future. Thank you. That is not okay. Hi, Betsy Chalmers. I live at 17 Fairway Drive. Um, even though I'm speaking on behalf of Jody tonight, I just want to say that the three women in front of me are incredibly competent, and I admire their dedication and commitment to our schools, and I trust them with decisions for my children every day. Um, I first got to know Jody a little bit through PTA, I think primary PTA. Um, and then, she, of course, she was on the CEF board. And I sort of feel like I've been following in Jody's footsteps because I got involved with the PTA. And I think I took her place on the CEF board. And I'm currently the secretary. I don't intend to be the vice president. Um, <laughs> but she's someone who I, um, I could follow in her footsteps because you were so competent in what you did in, in being one of the founding members of CEF and you starting up the race for the point. I think that's the biggest PTA fundraiser ever. Huge success and a lot of fun. And um, I hope that the three of you will get to continue the good work and the hard work that you've been doing for our students and we'll continue to support you in that. Thank you. Thank you. Benjamin Howard, 4 Oakdale Drive. I had originally come intending to speak on the benefits of a later school start time for our students, but it seems collectively in a room we all understand the benefits for a later school start time in our community. So instead, I've sat back for the last couple of hours and just listened. From what I hear, I question whether this is really a forum discussing the woman's before me incompetence are really just a platform to bring up a different issue that hasn't really been brought to the light. It seems to me there are a group of people in this community that there, there is concern that the communication channels between the teachers and the administration and the school board is fractured in some sort of way. And they may have felt that this is the only way they could bring light to that issue. Again, this is only of my opinion and from listening here but over and over, it seems that there's a great concern between these communication channels and listening to the individuals that sit in our classroom with the students every single day. I'm sad that we had to come to this point to get here. I think, um, in, in my opinion, it's sad that we abuse the system here to bring up this issue, but that isn't of importance. It's the democratic process. The signatures were gotten. 
They were verified by Todi, and we are here, and we will now have an election, and people will come out and vote. But I think we should take away from this tonight that maybe we do need to listen to the community and that there is another issue potentially at hand that we should maybe put more light into. Um, but I do not believe that any of these women before me are incompetent. I think this may be, have just been a channel to get a different issue on the table for people to and bring it to the light. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jesse Humble. I live at Four High Point Road. This is my first time speaking at a town council meeting. Although I do not personally know Ms. Beely, Ms. Lyford, or Ms. Shea, what I do know is that my children attend great schools in Scarborough, thanks to having a strong school board and superintendent. What's happening here is not a crisis, just a disagreement. Recalling three hardworking, capable, and smart women from the school board is both unprofessional and irrational. Everything that the school board has produced in the last few years has been well researched and they have made informed and open decisions on behalf of our children. The question tonight is of incompetence. I have no doubt in my mind that these three individuals are not only competent, but they are also dedicated people that have the best interests of our students and our community in mind. The recall effort has been irrational and emotionally driven, which is typical of bullying behavior. Please join me in supporting the Scarborough Board of Education. William Summers, uh, Holmes Road. Um, wanted to address, uh, address uh, Jody directly only because I've known Jody for a while and we've actually had uh, chances to speak before. Um, I will say that I've always found her to be uh, a voice of uh, compelling interest for the schools uh, and, and I applaud her for that. Um, I also want to reflect on Ms. Light, Mrs. Lightford's uh, commentary that we dehumanize this and I will say that I am guilty of that and probably many of us are because we're looking at this not as people. I don't, I'm not looking at you and wishing ill on you. I'm not looking at you and thinking that you wish ill on, on this town. I know that's not the case. But we have a, a significant problem on our hands and the question is how do we deal with that and still maintain personal relationships. If you look at this room, I could, I could pull this room right now and, and ask everyone who <laughs> wants our schools to fail to raise their hand and nobody will raise that hand. And yet we have a room divided distinctly on this issue. And that's, that's unfortunate. And so Ms. Shea, who I think is a reasonable person and who I have some knowledge of, how do you fix that? What's our mechanism to bring change so that these factions come back together where they should be so that the support for the schools is reunited, that's divided currently, that's not healthy. You are in a position, Mrs. Kuchenberger is in a position to change that. Are you willing to? And what have you demonstrated in that willingness to bring these factions together? We're talking at each other. You're gonna hear people stand up and say one thing about their position and the other people are gonna stand up and say another thing about their position and we're talking at each other, it's not effective. And so you're an elected leader. Your job is to bridge that divide. It's not my job, it's not anybody in this audience's job because we're not in your position. You have the uh, power and authority to do that. So if you want to not have this recall vote and if you want to stay in the position that you have, what is your solution? How have you communicated those solutions to me? I'm here, I'm willing to talk to you, I'm willing to talk to anybody and I, I believe you probably are feeling the same and yet we're not getting there still. So we need that to change, and you need to drive that change, and, and the superintendent needs to drive that change if the intention is to keep things together. Whether you stay in your position or not, this needs to change for our town, and you need to be the leader to bring that change. And so Mrs. Shea, I ask you to do that for this town. Whether your intention is to stay on the board or not, you have a lot of experience and you know the mechanisms of this town very well, and you could drive that change personally, and I ask you to do that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Jennifer Cleary, 33 Meeting House Road. We are here this evening to request your support in putting the recall of School Board Vice Chairman Jody Shea to vote by the citizens of Scarborough. This is not about Jody's work ethic. She has worked diligently for years trying to do the right thing for Scarborough schools, most re recently as a member of the Board of Education and Chair of the Board Finance Committee. This is not about her leadership capabilities. She has garnered support from her colleagues as evidenced by her position as Vice Chair of the Board. And of utmost importance, this is not a personal attack. So why are we, why are we, bleh, sorry, why are we requesting recall? Looking at what she has done for the town in past years, we initially had a hard time answering that question. In reflecting on recent issues impacting our schools, we gained clarity. The Later Start Time Initiative Rose in the, arose in the fall of 2015 after school administrators and leaders, including BOE members from Scarborough, attended a conference in Saco regarding school start times. In November of that year, Ms. Beely announced the formation of an advisory group. The board leadership, including Ms. Shea, immersed themselves in researching in research advocating later start times with plans to move forward for the 17-18 school year. On April 6, 2017, at the first reading of the proposed school calendar, several people spoke out against a later high school start time of 8.50 a.m. and suggested that the board look at a compromise instead. At the following board meeting, after the second reading of the school calendar, many people in attendance once again spoke out against the start time and the 8 a.m. start time for primary schools. In the board discussion, Ms. Perry stated that the proposed start time was too drastic. Ms. Shea appeared to have listened to the public comments and proposed a deferral on the start times for the 2017-18 school year. However, in defending her motion, she stated, quote, to be clear, for me, this opens it up to, it, is this something we should do? I don't want to give the impression that this is back up for discussion. This is the right thing to do implementation will take place in the 1819 calendar. The board affirmed that the superintendent has the authority to establish start end times, but the board approves the calendar. Then they charged the superintendent to come back to the board in January 2018 after, tra after a transportation audit was completed. Uh, Matt Scyther, 14 Hundley Drive. Throughout this process, Mrs. Shea has been an attract intractable in her support and advocacy for the drastic start time changes, despite a consistent community outcry for compromise. Mrs. Shea turned a blind eye to issues impacting students, families, and staff throughout Scarborough in what appeared to be a steadfast quest to implement these changes, regardless of an overriding negative response from students, staff, parents, and administrators. For the past year, in addition to later start times, our schools have been working toward the implementation of proficiency-based education. As the state of Maine moved toward making PBE mandatory, Scarborough began defining what PBE would look like in our district. Questions arose. Students and their parents asked how standards would equate to a numerical grade and how their GPA, if any, would show on their transcript for college admissions. The Department of Education ultimately tabled PBE implementation for the state. And yet, Superintendent Kuchenberger and the board leadership continued to move forward with implementation. In fact, at the beginning of the school year, the superintendent told staff that they would be, quote, building the airplane in flight, and that would be exciting, filled with many challenges and rewards, end quote. <laughs> Why? There appeared an inexplicable sense of urgency by Mrs. Shea and the superintendent to bring start times and PBE to fruition as soon as possible. The questions continued to grow, and the answers continued to fall short. Frustrated staff voiced their concerns to building level and central office administration, both verbally and in writing, to no avail over the course of several months. There appeared to be a breakdown in communication throughout the system. Where was the board leadership through all of this? Where was Vice Chair Shea? We are not quite sure, but as the legend goes, 
Nero played the fiddle while Rome was burning. So too has the leadership of the school board with the, super, with the Scarborough schools. Red flags were raised, but it was not until the forced resignation of Principal David Creech that the entire community opened their eyes and raised their voices. Please keep in mind as we share a timeline of events with you that he is an employee who at the conclusion of the 2017 school year met with the superintendent and received a 2% bonus for achieving and exceeding his professional goals and was granted a new contract. He has not received any letters of discipline nor any written documentation to make any changes in his leadership style or in his personal life. Does this sound like someone who is not a good fit? Where was Vice Chair Shea? She remained <coughs> silent. It was a personnel matter. She did not appear to exercise proper oversight on her one employee, Superintendent Kuchenberger. Thank you. Jillian Trapini Huff, Beach Ridge Road. In November of 2017, superintendent looking for a ways to, ways to allow athletes to leave school early when necessary, asked Principal Creech to garner input from the staff and how they felt moving uh, advisory from morning to the last block of the day. He agreed. December 7th, shared with the Implementation Planning Committee the thoughts of the instructional leadership team and the high school staff. It was clear they did not want to make this change because it would devalue the advisory program and deter students from seeking academic help. On December 12th, Principal Creech met with Superintendent Guggenberger, who was upset with Principal Creech for sharing his staff's concerns with the IPC. Principal Creech remained, uh, reminded her that she had re uh, requested the information and that he had asked if she wanted him to report out. On February 4th, Chairwoman Bealey and Vice uh, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Shea emailed David Creech directly. Chairwoman Bealey stated, do you have time this week for Jody and I to meet with you briefly? We wish to, have, uh, to get your thoughts on the best way to meet with your staff. Following, the following day, Principal Creech sent an email uh, to Superintendent Kuchenberger and um, as a responsible principal would and stating that he, would, uh, he wanted to discuss with this with her um, as he had not received a similar request before and that he did not want to overstep. He questioned the appropriateness of this request, uh, supporting the incompetence of Mr. Shea and Mrs. Bealey. The concerns are as follows. Any request of this type should be processed through the superintendent of schools. A school board does not have, uh, manage the staff. They manage the superintendent who is, has the responsibility to manage the staff. The school board members meeting with the staff directly for any reason would send the message to our staff that the board does not trust the superintendents to manage them. The school board has no authority when they meet with the staff in this manner. They assume authority when they hold a school board meeting um, and have a quorum. If they are meeting, if, they're, if they have something important to share with our staff, they would hold a public forum at a school board meeting and invite our staff to attend. Principal Creech concluded by stating, I'm always willing to meet with the board members. However, this request raised a red flag and I knew you as the superintendent should be involved. Later that morning, Superintendent uh, Kuchenberger responded, I am fully involved. I have met with Donna and Jody and I am aware of the support uh, and support this request. I suggest that they meet with you. I suggested that they meet with you to discuss the best way to engage the high school. From my perspective, it would be, it would have been the best, it would have been superintendent's professional respons responsibility to apprised Principal Creech prior to the request of Mrs. Bealey and Mrs. Shea. Later that day, the superintendent sent an email to the leadership council explaining the board members would not would uh, be meeting with the staff to discuss uh, start, school start times for the next year. Thank you. Nate Daigle, 15 First Street, Scarborough. On February 6th, Superintendent Kuchenberger announced to administration that the SEA union reps had met with her and would announce their non-support of school start times for next year at the next school board meeting. She also shared with the leadership council that staff should not be sharing their opinions on social media and indicated that most of this is from the high school staff with some from the middle school. School leaders were then told to inform staff they must discontinue making comments. Principal Creech then spoke up and stated, I have and will continue to make it clear to our staff members that no one should be politicizing anything in class or during school. The staff have asked if they can speak at school board meetings if they live in town, and I have told them yes. 
and encourage them to be respectful and professional. Principal Creech also suggested that the school consult an attorney prior to such, sweeping, such a sweeping statement to ensure that they would not be infringing on teachers' rights as individuals. On February 8th, the high school uh, ILT sent a letter to Superintendent Kuchenberger regarding the PBE grading system for incoming freshmen. The next day, Superintendent Kuchenberger sent Principal Creech an email indicating that she was upset that the ILT contacted her directly questioning his leadership and demanding a written explanation by 4 p.m. He submitted it at 2.05 p.m. In contrast, the superintendent sent a thank you letter to the ILT stating, thank you for sharing this letter with me. I appreciate the time and effort uh, put in to coordinate your collective thinking and look forward to working together. Thank you for your passionate leadership and commitment to our students. On February 12th, Superintendent Kuchenberger held a leadership meeting that would that state Excuse meeting. me, can you yeah. relate this to uh, uh, Mrs. Shea? This is a continuation of the statement from before. So, But uh, we still aren't seeing any connection to Mrs. Shea. It's it just seems to be a recitation of... Well, why don't we get to the part that... It requires respect, with all due respect, as we're just trying to... Mm -hmm. I've got about a half a paragraph. Go right ahead. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, <coughs> so I've lost my place. Uh, on February 12th, Superintendent Kuchenberger held a leadership meeting that stated and stated that advisory programs at both the middle and high school would be moved to the end of the day and proceeded to display a proposed schedule in the overhead projector. Assistant Superintendent Sizemore then asked Principal Creech what he was going to do in the high school to roll this out. He had just learned of this and as such stated he did not have a plan. He later spoke with Mrs. Sizemore and asked why he was the only one pressed on that subject and she responded that he thought he might go back to this high school and not support the decision. Principal Creech told her that she was questioning his integrity and he would do the exact opposite of what she was accusing him of. This, in conjunction with the timing of Ms. Bealey and Ms. Shea's letter to David Creech, appeared to exhibit evidence of mounting effort by central office and the Board of Education to discredit this principal. On February 14th, Superintendent Kuchenberger shared with the principal, shared with Principal Creech that she would be, meet with the high school ILT at 2.25 to discuss the start times. Her verbiage was clearly one sided cited, highlighting opportunities created by this disruption and its metrics to show it's working. She also stated unequivocally that... We should that, be mindful of the yep. uh, red... Yep. That advisory would be at the end of the school day. Kristen Nilsson, 23 Morning Street. This is a continuation of Mr. Daigle's response. On Thursday, February 15th, Principal Creech was called to meet with, super, with the superintendent in her office at 10 a.m. She informed him that she was not going to renew his contract. He asked her why, and she said she would not discuss it other than to say he was no longer a good fit. He was told to resign by Monday or face non-renewal, which for those of you who may not know, is somewhat of a career-ending scenario. She made it clear that the conversation was over. Later that day, Ms. Bealey and Ms. Lyford met with SHS staff to discuss start and end times for the schools. The high school staff had many questions and concerns regarding this, but the school board listened, providing no answers. And that evening at the school board meeting, the SEA announced its non-support of the start time decision. On Friday, February 16th at 11 a.m., Principal Creech, under duress, turned in his resignation to the superintendent. At the close of the day, Principal Creech announced his resignation to a stunned staff. Shortly after the meeting, he sent an email regarding his resignation to the Scarborough School community. After countless emails and comments of support, Principal Creech tried to rescind his resignation. On February 22nd, at a meeting with attorneys, Superintendent Kuchenberger, Chairwoman Bealey, and, attorney, and um, Principal Creech, Principal Creech's attorney stated, that he was coerced into resigning and wanted to rescind the resignation. He was also accused without merit of pushing the community to start rallying support for him through protests, social media, et cetera. 
Principal Creech denied orchestrating those efforts, which were, in fact, put forth by students, staff, parents, and community members. How hard is it for the board to believe that this community genuinely reveres this person and that there is no agenda? On the first day back from February break, hundreds of students and parents stood in protest on Municipal Drive near Town Hall. The staff lined the entryway for Principal Creech to walk into the building amidst posters and banners showing support for him. This ignited Scarborough into a movement, the likes of which we have never seen in this community. And what did Vice Chair say? What did Vice Chair Shea say about this? Nothing. Other than, to, other than claiming it was a personnel matter, when they did speak, it was to say that their concern was for the safety of the children, which left many to speculate unnecessarily about Principal Creech placing the students in an unsafe environment or situation. As the groundswell of anger and confusion continued, questions as to why David Creech was forced to resign grew with speculation, yet Ms. Shea, Ms. Bealey, and Superintendent Kuchenberger remained silent. Is that competent leadership? Where is the accountability? Through all of this, Principal Creech took the high road, carrying out daily school operations in a professional manner. As always, he placed the school and the community in front of himself, especially as he guided them through a recent week of great triumph in the SATs and the naturalization ceremony, combined with great tragedy in the school's community. Dave did so with grace in, and respected that all communication would go through the superintendent. However, the superintendent, under board supervision, allowed four articles to run in the Portland Press Herald questioning the effectiveness of the Student Services Department. Ms. Shea could have intervened, but she did not. By not making Please a public- Please be mindful of the red. Yes, by, by not, I have a sentence left. By not making a public statement, the board and superintendent furthered the divide with the high school staff when they should have been closing the gap and coming together. Ms. Shea has not practiced what I believe as competent oversight of the superintendent, her one employee. Thank you. Speakers, please try to address the remarks to Mrs. Shea. Torn Elson, 23 Morning Street. Uh, Jody. Uh, Words can't say at this point, but I'll say that Liam Summers probably summed it up the best, so I'll let it go at that. As was just said, the Board of Education is responsible for evaluating the superintendent of schools, their only employee. Somebody mentioned earlier the person that had a meeting with the superintendent of schools, I'm that person, and I tried to broker a deal, so to speak, just to get somebody to speak try to negotiate where the superintendent and the principal would sit down and talk and try to get things resolved. That never happened. Through all this, where was the board leadership? The chair and the vice chair. In the best interest of the schools and the community, they should have asked the superintendent to rescind the resignation and start the healing process. Why didn't the leadership of the board step up? Why did the board and the superintendent remain silent? If the principal had done something that would warrant his termination, then that should have been done immediately. And then one only has to wonder again, did the superintendent make this decision on her own, or was it under a directive from the leadership of the board? Ms. Shea and Ms. Beely. Or was it a joint effort to remove him because he shared with them his opinion and his disagreement? <coughs> if it was Ms. Shea's decision, it is incompetence that drives a leader to expect to eliminate those with differing opinions. If not, it is a leader's incompetence to fail to oversee and correct the actions of her one employee. As evidenced by an email Ms. Shea sent to Ms. Beely and the superintendent to strategize how to pull board members' support back to the drastic start times, she sought to convince others on the board who asked for a compromise she was right and did not entertain compromise until the 11th hour. On Friday, February 16th at 6.35 p.m., Superintendent Kuchenberger sent an email to the Leadership Committee regarding Principal Creech's resignation and signing off with, have a great weekend. 
We saw leadership at the building level, but that's where it stops. As Vice Chair of the Board, Jody Shea, along with the Superintendent, had ample opportunities to derail the petition drive, and that is a quote, by the way, that I used. But they chose not to do so, and it wasn't until after the petitions were submitted for certification that the Board agreed to compromise on the start end times. And so over 3,000 signatures later, we find ourselves here. To us, the incompetence is obvious. For the record, David Creech did not get me as part of the troops being rallied around the community. People in the community spoke with me and had me step up. Students and teachers, you have a high school filled with very capable people who can think for themselves. And that's what they did, and here we are today. Thank you. Mary Starr, Six Haystack Circle. I'm here to show support for my fellow board member, Jody Shea. I remember clearly when Jody joined the board almost five years ago, I think. I was at her very first meeting, and I was so impressed with her commitment to our town. As, as she eloquently said, she's been a community leader for many years prior to joining the board. It's, I think as soon as her child, oldest child entered school, she got involved coordinating the school fair for the K-2 schools and heading up the PTO and also being a founding member of the Scarborough Education Foundation. She cares deeply about this community and has done so much to better our schools. This is commitment and competence. As a longtime volunteer myself in the schools, I know that volunteers like jo Jody are rare. Most people do not make this kind of commitment to our schools. Jody and I grew up in the same neighborhood, so I've known her a long time. But I can say without a doubt, I've learned so much from her during my time on the board. I am continually impressed with her insight and her passion for our schools. Countless times I've listened while she has given her viewpoint on an issue, and she's opened my eyes to different ways to look at the issue. Before joining the board, I was always grateful to her for her work on the Finance Committee, and that has not changed. There is no one that knows the school budget better than Jody. Whenever there's a, there's a budget issue, she asks insightful, intelligent questions. And we are fortunate to have her talent on the board. Without her knowledge, we would be at a disadvantage during budget time. She works collaboratively with everyone, and she's not afraid of disagreements and sharing her opinion on matters. This has been a difficult time for all the board members that were subject to the recall. But like Carrie and Donna, her commitment has never wavered. I don't think that many people in this room would be able to handle this hearing, and I commend them for their commitment to our students when resigning would have been the easier choice. I encourage our community to think deeply about this decision and the ramifications. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Jeremy Gronin, Holmes Road, Scarborough. Uh, try to keep this short and sweet. Um, I got at the big Board of Education meeting that got transferred down to Wentworth Cafeteria. A lot of faces there, a lot of concerned parents. Um, I got up and spoke briefly saying there's a, a bunch of issues we need to be careful on, you know, um, whether it be the start times and the PBE or the Mr. Creech issue. Uh, the start times compromised, the PBE's gone by the wayside. Mr. Creech has still been a huge, a huge point of contention with a lot of people in town. Um, this is not a personal thing. I, I think you're all wonderful as people. You're not vindictive, you're not out to get the kids, you're not out to get me, you're not out to get anybody in this, in this room. I think what we found though is after that last big meeting at Wentworth, which I'm sure you all remember that, I'm sure a lot of, people, a lot of you people were there, uh, people were concerned, and it seemed like it fell on deaf ears after the next day came and went, it was just business as usual, we were gonna keep on moving forward. Um, I'd like to ask you each a, a question, who is your employee? You can just... No, there's no... No, no okay, I'm sorry. I, I, out of turn. One thing I'd also like to point out, um, I don't want my daughter, third grade, flying on any airplane that's being built as it's going through the sky. That's not how I roll. I want something to be solid. I want something to be proven. I want something to be safe, and I want something to be dependable. I feel the recall is not a personal issue on each one of you individually. It's about the whole group and the lack of faith amongst people in town saying, where are we going? What's going on with the, t 
town. I don't want the school system making headlines across the country for the wrong reasons. You know, we're a good, we're a good town, we're a good school system. Uh, we need to get back to where we were. This is all very unfortunate. I'm upset about it. Um, a lot of people came forward and signed their name, okay? I personally didn't like any of those signatures being posted on Facebook I've seen. I don't like a lot of the emails going around town that I've seen. I don't like any secrets in town. I want everybody to be on the same page. We're all taxpayers. We all have a vested interest in this town. We have kids in the school system. We want to know what's going on. So if we could have one person get up and say, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it versus it being all kind of hidden and secretive and behind the closed doors and nobody knows who's doing what, I think we'd be a lot better off. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dave Dittmer, 11 Woodside Drive. I'm uh, ashamed to be up here tonight. I'm standing before and addressing all three women who have been put through this. Years and years of volunteer experience, not just on the school board, but other activities throughout Scarborough. And because it's the most convenient way to get something done, They've been put on this awful ride. Someone earlier mentioned Nero and fiddling while Rome burned. I've, I've been thinking about a different analogy, something my ninth grade daughter um, brought home for part of her classwork, The Crucible by Arthur Miller, where a group of people decided that some people needed to be dealt with. And if you're not familiar with the Crucible, it was about the Salem witch trials. I cast no aspersions on you. In fact, some of my friends are witches, and that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> However, I would not like that same outcome. There is a chance that we can heal. And someone earlier was addressing that it was on the school board's shoulders. But as the school board struggles to get anyone to come out and support a budget, where 2,400 people can't pass a budget, but 3,600 can sign a recall petition, that's ludicrous. We're all responsible for this. I'm ashamed to be here as a citizen, as a business owner, and hearing people from out of town saying, what is going on in Scarborough? And here you are. You're going on in Scarborough simply because we can't come to an agreement. Again and again, we've heard tonight, it's not personal. We've heard facts and figures, Freedom of Information Act, going through day by day, time by time, this email went at this time, that email went at that time. Things change because of it. This group that started this petition, they had three goals. <clears throat> Change the start time to a hybrid, get rid of the per strict performance-based education, and principal creatures issues. The first two, they have admitted those compromises happened, and not without what they did. That's fantastic, if only because they feel involved and got involved. They were holding signs. They were making sure that everyone signed the petition. But when the time comes for budget, are we going to have that same interest? We can stop this now, and I'm aware of the time. We can stop this now if the people who have brought the petition recognize that they have victories. And before they make it personal and put you on the chopping block or in the pillory, maybe they can say, you know what, we've made a good start, and let's keep these board members because we've got their attention. That's all I have. Thank you. <coughs> Sonia Serafin, Ryefield Drive. I had no plans to speak today. I don't have anything um, formally 
put together. I've jotted some notes as people spoke, and I want to say thank you for everyone being in here four plus hours, including the three folks in front of me. Um, I worked all day. I'm surviving on a bowl of Rice Krispies for dinner. I don't know about the rest, the rest of everyone else, but um, I cannot judge any of you personally. I don't know any of you personally. I'm a parent. Um, so I believe you're in a position because you want to do the best thing for children. I went to school to be a high school English teacher. I didn't end up in that profession. I ended up in human resources for 16 years for some big companies at a director level. So I feel I can objectively look at both sides of things um, from a unique perspective. Um, I'm left with more questions with this meeting. I think that the three women in front of us have an excellent resume. I think they've done wonderful things for the community. And I thank you, because I think that'll benefit my seven-year-old. I had the opportunity to speak to Julie um, just one time, but it was for over two hours in the parking lot as we shivered. I was very impressed with her, um, what she wanted to do for the community. But I'm still left with a lot of uh, questions. So while I think intentions are good, I try to think of other scenarios. I think about big companies and businesses that were once successful but have to close their doors. They go bankrupt. External factors out of their control. Even though they had a laundry list of wonderful things they used to do. So I have a younger child, so I'm most concerned with what's happened in the last year or two. And I agree this process is very awkward and upsetting. And from an HR perspective, I hope we have other processes in the future where we can evaluate performance a little bit differently of the board members than in this fashion. But this is what was available, I think, to the Road to Renewal group. Um, so I don't think their intentions were to hurt anyone personally. That's just my opinion, because I have friends on both sides of the issue. But the questions I'm left with, if Julie isn't accountable and the board's not accountable for the current state of our community, are the teachers accountable? Are the students accountable? Are the parents accountable? Who is most accountable? And how do we address that accountability? So those are, that's a question that I'm asking myself as I consider the fate of these three passionate women on the school board. Who's accountable if it's not them? Maybe it's not them. But who is it then? Um, I've heard a lot about the teachers. I'm concerned that we're downplaying the concerns of the teachers. The teachers are our truth. They're with our children day in and day out. I'm concerned about the lead teacher's letters I wrote. I'm concerned about the no confidence vote. So why are the teachers feeling the way that they're feeling? It could be a combination of things, but who's ultimately accountable for that? Is it us? Is it the students? Is it Julie? Is it the board? I mean, these are some real questions we have to ask ourselves. Can you be mindful of your time? Yes, yeah, thank you. I didn't even notice it, actually, so thank you. These, we have to ask ourselves the hard questions and reflect upon how to make this community better. How did we get here? Who's accountable for that? We have to hold some accountability. Unfortunately, I've been asking myself those questions, and right now, for me, I feel it's the board that's accountable and Julie. From my personal experience, leadership stands up and takes accountability for the state of an organization. And right now, our state is not very good. But if other things are accountable and there's other factors, Thank you. Thank you. I hope Definitely. those improve as well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Lisa Douglas, 531 Disfasis. I apologize for being up here now my third time. Um, but the one board member that I can talk personally about is Jody Shea. And I have a moral obligation to share what I know. Um, I've been at Blue Point School ever since Jody's children first started there. From the time I was at that school and Jody's children started, Jody made herself a force of 110% backing support, competence, in forethought in everything we were doing, everything that we might need, every new innovative piece, 
that we might have coming down the pipe, right down the line. To put incompetence at all mumbled about in relation to Jody Shea specifically, as well as all these board members, as well as the superintendent, just is fraud. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work, it's not true. These people are very, very sharp. Jody is incredibly sharp. She comes to staff, she comes to community. I've tried to help her multiple times try and bring community members together to talk about things. Nobody shows up. Not because you didn't have the opportunity, not because I didn't have the opportunity, whatever. The opportunity was there, is there, always has been there. That's competence. But the bottom line is these people have got to make decisions. They're not put there to poll their constituency and vote the way the constituency is. That's not what they're elected there for. They're elected to do due do, do diligence Listen to us, factor everything in, and make a responsible decision. So I thank you, Jody, personally, for everything that I've had the experience to do with you, both during school hours as well as after school hours, at the carnivals that you and I have worked on together, and the countless number of other things, race to the point, everything you still have your hands in. And I commend you. I don't know, after going through this, if I could say, this town deserves one more moment of my effort. But gosh, I hope you do. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Drew Stevens, 6 Surrey Lane. Um, is it okay to talk about all three? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, school rankings, I just wrote a few notes tonight. I didn't have anything planned. School rankings increased under this Board of Education over the last few years, even with less state funding. That sounds like competence. Jody was the finance chair of the BOE that spearheaded collaboration with the finance chairs on the town council um, so that we can better communicate the budget with the town and have less confusion about the numbers. Um, created that fantastic one sheet with both Julie and Tom Hall. Again, competence. Judy and Carrie, uh, Jody and Carrie, sorry Jody, um, have been go-to's for policy and understanding around the way our schools function for anyone who has questions. I can go through literally dozens of people. When you have a question about what's going on in the town, if you're confused about something in the school budget, if something that you just don't know where to go to get the answer, they would say, I call Jody. So, incompetence, and actually, I've been there when people that are part of this road to renewal have reached out to Jody for answers, and now they're recalling her for not being competent. It's ridiculous. Um, Donna reached out to me. Actually, she reaches out to the whole community very regularly. She shows up at events. She plans events to get people involved, um, which is a huge benefit to the town, and I would consider that um, a major asset to our town and not incompetence. Um, I have been actively involved. Every one of you up here knows my name because I come to meetings regularly. Most people that are in this room aren't at meetings regularly. The reason I'm involved in what's going on in town is because Donna reached out to me and asked me to. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have realized that we could show up to these meetings and have a voice and have something to say. So she is anything but incompetent. Um, and lastly, coming to one school board meeting and airing your grievances and not following the protocols of the meeting does not demonstrate competence either. However, if you show up week after week and month after month to meetings that few townspeople show up to, to committee meetings that are behind closed doors that nobody knows about, and they spend hours away from their kids and their families to do the work of our town, like you all do, that is not incompetence it's easy to show up to a meeting and yell and scream. But these people are there every single week, month after month, year after year for some of them. And to just have people jump in all of a sudden and go, you don't listen to us, is ridiculous. And it does not demonstrate incompetence. Um, and I know we're not supposed to talk about other issues, but I've heard plenty of it tonight already. The superintendent has taken time to meet with my family personally about issues that we are passionate about it might not be the same thing that other people are passionate about, 
She's sat down with us. She's listened to us. She has consistently tried to look at how the school system can improve so that those things don't happen or the good things happen more frequently. That's exactly what we'd want out of a superintendent. Again, competence. Hi, uh, I'm Cindy Kewick. I live at Six Moores Point Road. I originally came to talk about Jody. Um, I, I don't really know Jody, but I feel like I know her because we've run across each other so many times over the years. Uh, originally in the PTA, she was always running it, and I'd be the one like, what table do I have to go sell tickets at, or whatever. She was in charge. Um, I knew her from the Race to the Point, which I loved participating in. Um, when the Scarborough Education Foundation started, I was certainly not surprised to find out that she was one of the founding members. Uh, Jody is a doer. She's not a talker. She's not a sitter. She's a doer. She puts herself out there. She takes risks. She tries different things. And I have a ton of respect for her for that. Uh, this whole discussion tonight is really about the recall and the competency of Jody and the other people who are here. Um, it's, there's a lot of passion in this room, and I think there's a lot of really good intentions. There's a lot of concern for our teachers and our administrators, which really strikes a, a chord with me because I see my kids' teachers in here and their administrators, and I have really the utmost respect for all of them. I've always tried to treat them with respect, and uh, I, I, they've all, you know, always had it because they're so good. Um, this school board acts as a group, and it makes decisions as a group, and so. These concerns about these particular members and what they haven't done for our teachers or administrators, it really is difficult for me to come to terms with. Uh, when these three members were named, I was shocked, in fact. And I asked for specific reasons why. Why are these three members being singled out as being incompetent? Give me an example. Give me something specific. There are people in the Road to Renewal group that I've actually had a lot of conversations with because things aren't always black and white. And sometimes you got to talk to other people and find out what's going on. But not once was I given a specific example. And so if the board works as a group and makes decisions as a group, why are these three people being held accountable for all the ills that people are seeing? Why are these three people sitting here at a table tonight having to face this? I haven't heard a single reason why. Nobody has given me an example. I'm certainly not suggesting that we recall the entire school board, so please, nobody think that's where I'm going. Um, I think they do good work. I think they work really hard, and I have a lot of respect for them. And if somebody can really enlighten us and give us a really good reason why this recall has to happen right now, you know, I certainly would be open to hearing it, but I haven't heard anything. These people deserve to stay in the office that they're serving in. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Bailey, 12 Gunstock Road. I've worked with Jody on the board for the past four and a half years. She is a highly valued, capable board member, particularly since she has taken on the most difficult responsibility that the board has that of understanding that finance budget as a member of just a citizen of this community to step forward and step up every year. I have so appreciated that she would do that. She has dedicated an enormous amount of time to understanding that budget. She knows it thoroughly. She's articulate with the public in answering the questions she rarely doesn't have the answer. She's proficient and efficient with finances. Every single year that I have been on the board now, I have held my fingers crossed every fall, hoping that somebody on the board would have the competency in finances that she has. She's absolutely a wonderful asset to this community. She will explain the budget to you and anyone who has a question about it. She is trustworthy. She is honest. 
She's sincere and she is tireless in her work on this board. And I'm proud to serve with her and I thank her for her work, her amazing work that she has done for four and a half years in her dedication and competency <coughs> to this board. Thank you. Any further speakers? Close the public hearing. Uh, final word? Yes. Thank you. Uh, from Colleen Quattararo. Did I get it right this time? <laughs> Sorry, Italian is not my thing, apparently. Words to describe Jody Shea. Kind, mindful, hardworking, selfless, student-centered, balanced, fun-loving, progressive, fair-minded. She's doing a job for no pay and little appreciation because she cares for our children, and she has, for as long as I've known her, she founded the SEF, for goodness sake. The good she's done for our students is a long and well-documented list. Jody is basically the definition of competent. From Kristen Allen. I met Jody in the early fall of 2015 after our school budget finally passed our third referendum vote. I quickly learned how highly competent Jody is. Not only has she served our town on the Board of Education, but was a co-founder of Scarborough Education Foundation and the Race to the Point. She is giving countless hours of service to our town through volunteering, lobbying, and standing up for our children, teachers, staff, and schools. It takes a high degree of competence to have accomplished what Jody has during the last few years. She deserves our support and thanks. From jo John Clotier. While I have never met Jody, I see no evidence to support the allegation that she is incompetent. Her list of accomplishments and selfless devotion to our community are Hall of Fame caliber. She is one of the reasons that Scarborough schools are so great. From Colleen Aman, I've known Jody for a couple of years because of our involvement with the schools. She has always been kind, friendly, professional, and extremely passionate about anything related to Scarborough schools and students. As a Board of Education member, Jody has gone above and beyond to serve the Scarborough community. She is respectful, professional, researches issues, responds to emails in a timely fashion, and always puts the students first. I would never use the word incompetent to describe Jody Shea. Thank you. Mrs. Shea. Since the recall position, um, petitions were circulated, I've had a few things that stand out to me. One, I believe Scarborough is an incredible place to live, and I know our community will get through this stronger and more connected. I have to believe that. Two, I think, our, I think about our students, all of them, K through 12, that are old enough to understand what's going on, hear things around town or from friends, but I especially think about our seniors. The unfortunate part of all of this isn't about me or Carrie or Donna or any of the adults in this room. It's about our seniors. The fact is that this time should be about them. This time should be about their accomplishments, their excitement for whatever is next after high school, their futures. This is a big year, an exciting time, full of possibility. And I don't want any of this to define their time. And three, this cannot be how we govern. <laughs> Disagreeing with me over a policy or a vote that I make doesn't mean you kick me out of office. It does mean that you can choose to not reelect me. It means we need to find common ground and build from there. Winston Churchill is quoted as saying, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. He, we must speak up and voice our opinions and thoughts, but we, almost, but we must also sit down and listen to all sides, hear the argument. We hear arguments from both sides all the time, and it's weighing those countering opinions that, that need to be listened to. We are not going to be right all of the time, but if we truly listen, there is bound to be some common ideas to build from. If we kick people out of office because we don't agree with them, we lose. This town loses. We set a poor example of how to work through differences for our youngest citizens. If you disagree with someone, you voice your concerns and work to compromise and find common ground. This experience has been one of the most challenging for me. While it has been challenging for Donna, Carrie, and I for obvious reasons, it's also challenging and difficult for our children, our spouses, our parents, our siblings and family, and even our friends who have had to watch all of this craziness and hear unpleasant descriptions of us from neighbors and coworkers and the media. While it, it has been said this isn't personal, People have made it personal. I have had to have far too many conversations with my 13-year-old and 10-year-old about why this is happening, 
what it means, what will happen to me, and what people think I did wrong. My husband and I have had to speak with, um, my husband and I have had lots of conversations about how to deal with it at school with our middle schooler. We have always taught our kids that it's okay to disagree with something, but there's a difference between civil discourse and tearing someone down because you disagree with them. I am proud of the way the three of us have, have handled this situation. And no matter what happens, we can hold our heads high. I am proud of the work we have done. I am proud of this school district. And I am confident that Scarborough will find its voice and strength. This is a defining moment for our community. What direction do we go from here? How do we rise up and handle what is being asked of us? When people think of Scarborough, what will they think? Thank you for your comments. It's, it's not easy to sit here and hear everything that is said tonight, but it's important for all of us to grow. So if I can take something that was said and, be, and become a better school board, man, school board member, and you can hear something that maybe we've said that helps you become a better citizen, friend, or parent, then we all win in the end. Again, tonight isn't a policy debate. If you disagree with my position or the votes I've taken, if you feel that I'm not representing what you believe is your interest on the school board, then next November you have your chance to vote me out. That's what elections are for. To the town council, um, thank you for allowing each of us the opportunity to speak and have a voice. As I mentioned, this hasn't been easy, but we all agree it is time for our community to heal. This has taken a lot of time and energy away from the job that we should be doing as a district and as a town. It is time to find our common ground and heal as a community, as a school district, and as people. It is a time to release the grudges, stop the continued fighting, and move forward as a town. Scarborough is better than this, and I look forward to a resolution soon so we can all move forward in a more productive way. Thank you. That concludes the uh, public hearings. Uh, the board, uh, town council has one additional items left on its agenda. We have to take a procedural vote to take it up uh, after 10 o'clock, uh, which we will. Uh, what's the uh, interest of the board? Two minute uh, break? Let people leave who want to leave? Order, Good. Order. You had said at the beginning of the meeting there would be public comment before the final agenda item. Yes. Right. What we have to do is <clears throat> take a break, uh, come back, take a procedural vote to continue to uh, take up the last item of the night, uh, and then there'll be the opportunity for public comment. Good. We're temporarily adjourned for two, two minutes. I <laughs> always... <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. It's cold. It's now cold. Yeah. What a long day. What's 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 Chris asking? Why? Why we? Why we taking a Why wasn't there a motion before this? Yes. Some days I feel that way. It depends on the day. Is there really bad? Short comments. Flip it over lightly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, uh, I'll accept the motion to uh, waive our 10 o'clock limitation rule and continue. So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Uh, order 18-36, act on the request to set the date, time, and location of the three recall elections for the Board of Education for Tuesday, May 8, 2018 <coughs> at 7 a.m. at the Municipal Building located at 259 U.S. Route 1 in Scarborough. Uh, uh, public comment is in order. <coughs> David Cleary, 33 Meeting House Road. I stand before council to specifically question the position the chairman has taken in the posted agenda for this evening's proceedings regarding the recall election date. On Monday, the town clerk provided me with absentee ballot data for school board referendum votes going back to 2015. Seven elections in all. As special elections, these provided the most relevant comparative data. I used the data to compare the number of days available for absentee voting and the impact on election results making relative comparison to the date of May 8th for the recall election. In the chairman's two memos published last Friday, five days before tonight's vote has even occurred, by selecting May 8th instead of June 12th for the recall election, the impact will intentionally minimize voter turnout and hence influence results. If votes cast are even just one shy of the 3,147 minimum required, the recall fails. Minimizing voter turnout to influence an election based on personal opinions, feelings, friendships, and agendas is not in the best interest of the town. Comments made by counselors such as gross misuse of the recall process, and I'm so disappointed in this town, as well as the chairman's own advanced justification and reasoning for selecting May 8th are examples of this sentiment. From that is my opinion, without question, members of this town council want the recall vote to fail. From the data going back to 2015, absentee ballots are a critical component <coughs> to voting results in Scarborough. Across seven elections, the average number of absentee ballot days was 18. In the three most recent elections, the average number of days was 22. Absentee ballots accounted for 34%, fully one-third of all ballots cast, for all these seven elections, yet this increases to 40 percent, four in ten, in the most three recent elections, because more time was available. By comparison, May 8th, a May 8th, elec May 8th election date provides only nine business days. This is at least 50 percent fewer days than the historical average and 59 percent fewer days than the average of the three most recent votes. Many, many residents who vote absentee get their news from the Scarborough leader and may not even be informed until publication on Friday, May 4th, just four days before polls close. By choosing an election date of May 8th instead of June 12th, town council is dramatically influencing potential vote, votes cast. To resolve this matter in the best interests of the town, it is imperative the maximum number of voter voices be heard. An American diplomat said, elections matter, but how much they matter depends entirely on how free, open, and fair they are. I ask you to do the right thing. Schedule the recall, recall election on June 12th. Give the voters their voice. It is your duty. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brian Shumway from Five Memory Lane. I'd like to reiterate some comments I made in an email to the town council regarding the projected date of the uh, recall election. One of the critical components of the uh, recall elements of our charter has to do with the threshold level of voting. The other component has to do with the proportion of voters who vote in favor of the recall. 
if we combine a budget vote, which will happen if we move to a May 12th, which will get pushed to a June 12th uh, election, we'll be conflating people's interest in the budget with their interest in the recall. Uh, we'll completely lose any data regarding that threshold issue about people's true interest in this recall vote. Uh, David, I think you had it right. It is important to get the voters' true view. We've got more than the Scarborough leader now to inform our opinions. We've got Facebook, Twitter, videos, text. Voters have plenty of ways to learn about what's going on, to learn about the dates of the vote. And I think, um, I think it's hollow to suggest that we're um, disintegrating democracy by pushing to a June vote. So thank you. Thank you. Mary Starr, Six Haystack Circle. Um, I, am, uh, I realize this is a really difficult position for all of you to be in to uh, make the decision to when to, when to have the vote, because I, I can understand the viewpoints of the road to recall that they want to have more time to, you know, for people to vote. But I also think this is very different than like our annual budget vote. Uh, it's a recall vote on three individuals. It's not about an issue. It directly influences three members of our community and their families. Uh, I'm sure you can understand how difficult it is to be labeled incompetent by your neighbors. I, I appeal to your sense of humanity that this vote should be held in May and not held for another six weeks. It's unfair to them and to our entire community. I also worry about the toxicity of the environment for our students. The longer this drags on, for more, there's, it allows for more negativity to fester. We need to heal as a community. Our high school seniors are graduating on June 10th. We need to have this settled prior to graduation. This situation is taking away from the experience for all our students because they only get one shot at their student lives for 2018, whichever grade they are in. So I urge you to vote for an earlier date. I, um, I appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Swalla, 9 Rocky Hill Road. Um, I urge the town council to have the election for this vote, um, for this recall in May. I realize it will cost the town money, but the future of our schools are worth it. The recall is a separate issue than the budget and should be treated as such. The recall petition itself had too many groups it was marketing towards. I've heard too many folks say they signed it for different reasons and not understanding the true nature of it and its future repercussions. Let's keep the election transparent and concise so as not to confuse voters. Our students deserve a clear path when we go to vote on the budget in June. Thanks. Thank you. Brent Crossman, 10 Barley Lane. Um, I wanted to highlight, I pulled a little bit of data from that. I, hopefully I did right. I didn't get to the town clerk's help, so hopefully I, I pulled the right numbers. Uh, Carrie and Jody each received about 9,000 votes in 2016. Uh, that was roughly three times what any board member or town councilor received last year. Um, now, it might be because they're three times more popular than the board members. Um, they're, they're very good school board um, a member, so that's possible, but I think they would probably also admit it had something to do with the 2016 election also being a presidential election. Mm -hmm. I don't think that um, three times as many people cared about the um, school board in 2016 than cared in 2017. Sinking up the recall vote with the budget does the same thing. It allows the recall vote to skirt the validation threshold by ensuring that voters will come to vote on another issue, the budget, and also happen to vote on the recall. The 30% threshold is important to ensure the recalls aren't easy, that we don't just start trying to recall every board member or town councilor that we disagree with. If you move the recall um, budget to sync it with the budget vote, the recall vote to sync it with the budget vote, then you'll subvert the purpose of that 30% threshold. And I think that will make these divisive recalls more likely in the future. Thank you. Hello, Betsy Gleistein, um, 14 Long Meadow Road. And I appreciate that this is, I'm sure, a difficult decision for you. If we didn't already have an election scheduled June 20th, I feel sure that you would be going out probably a good 20, 25 days um, from tonight so that we had ample time 
for absentee ballots to come back. It just so happens because we do have an election scheduled that the charter requires uh, this. So I, I sympathize with the position that you're in. Um, and I certainly sympathize uh, with what has been said in terms of um, the impact on people. But um, I think we really have to make sure that we don't disenfranchise um, the absentee voters. Um, nine business days is, is unprecedented and very, very short. Um, and I think uh, this happens quite a bit to our military voters, um, but this is extreme. Um, so I think we need to make sure that we have the most legitimate election possible, um, because if this election is not considered legitimate, I do think it will impact the budget. Then I think people will come back and go, well, my only recourse is to vote no for the budget because you know this election was held too quickly. So I think there are really good reasons that you all have outlined for trying to hold it May 8th. Like I said, I think if there was no June 12th, you'd probably be holding it in May 28th or something right after the, the holiday. Um, you have no choice but to uh, try to hold it within the time frame. Um, but I, uh, I would urge you to make it as legitimate as possible so everyone can walk away and say we had a legitimate vote, we had enough time for absentee ballots, you know, we had enough time for people to campaign or whatever they're going to do, um, and uh, then we can, we can truly start to heal at that point. I think we don't need controversy over the date. Um, I know people might prefer the earlier date, but the least controversial option for this board who's gotten dragged into the middle of this is June 12th. Not to mention it's the cheapest, but thank you very much. Thank you. Chad Shaw from Ten Bell Terrace. Um, I encourage the town council to keep this recall vote separate from the budget vote. These are two tremendously emotionally charged issues that deserve their own votes. Please don't combine them. The three civil servants that we've talked about here tonight deserve that. Keep the votes separate, please. Thank you. Hi, Kristen Nelson, 23 Morning Street. Um, you know, I've heard a lot tonight about the legitimacy of the vote and about, you know, confusing what the vote is about and, um, you know, coming out for the wrong reasons or the right reasons for one thing, but the wrong for another. I have a lot of faith in this community that they know what they're voting for or against. I believe that having the budget vote on the same day as the recall vote not only allows everybody involved to have the time to prepare for this election, but it also allows people to feel like they have a voice. And one of the things that you've heard a lot of tonight is people feeling that they don't have a voice or they feel shut down or they feel that there could potentially be bias around this election and the May 8th date. And I feel that in order to prevent that, let's have it in the same manner that we would have a presidential election and a Senate election and a referendum. People will come out to vote for a president and vote on a referendum. And a point of clarification too, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, the threshold of ballots that we must receive in order for the recall to be valid, those ballots have to have a vote for or against the recall. So if somebody is coming out to vote for the ballot, they will understand that they don't have to vote for or against the recall. There, people are, you know, and if there is a budget vote, if they submit a ballot for the budget, they may not submit a ballot for the recall. Does that, am I right in that? Okay. So putting the two together, all it does is it ensures that there won't be a huge boycott of the election and that everybody will have a fair chance, fair time to be heard and to make sure that everything is in order. So um, I think it would be a real disservice to this town if you put it on May 8th. And I know I've, I've voiced that opinion to you in email, um, but I also really wanna thank um, Councillor Hayes and Councillor Foley for 
um, you know, having the dialogue about it. I do appreciate that. And uh, please hold it on June 12th. I get this to Saratoga Lane. I, I thank you for your patience through this process and and for the manner in which the hearing has been conducted. I, I think that um, the consuls put a great deal of effort into um, conducting this hearing fairly and well, and I think it's represented both sides extremely fairly, and, and I want to thank you for that. Um, I, I do as a supporter of the recall, support the um, May, uh, the June 12th uh, election date. Um, I, I understand and, and hear as valid the concern about the impact to the, to the three individuals uh, facing recall, but um, in, in my viewpoint, the, um, the uh, uh, opposing concerns are so much stronger. Uh, we've got the resources and the costs associated with, with separate elections. Uh, we've got the interest of three individuals versus the inter interests of an entire community. Um, I'm not convinced at all that the turnaround time from today until May 8th will be sufficient to allow for absentee voting. And I think it's very important that we give the opportunity to our seniors, to our college students, to our service members to have the opportunity to vote absentee if, if needed. And finally, the, the protections that we're talking about are, are the emotional impact to, to the three, three individuals and the ability to um, give them some finality, which certainly is, is serious and something that needs to be considered and weighed, but it's being weighed against a constitutional protection. And, and in my mind, that that has to that has to win. And for those reasons, I'd ask you to support a June twelfth vote. Hi, I'm Deb Bunce <coughs> for Partridge Lane, and I would like to request the May eighth vote. I know that an earlier person came up and talked about. Um, the legitimacy, the legitimacy of the vote in terms of focusing on absentee ballots, but I really think we have to think about the, um, the legitimacy of the vote for the three board members and having the vote be really about them and not, as uh, Brent may have said, conflated by two different issues at the vote. People have said our citizens will understand exactly what they're voting for. I would love to believe that wholeheartedly but I know that's not always the case. And I know personally a number of people who signed the petition who had no idea what they were signing. And I believe that would happen in the vote as well. So let's have it be a vote where people are coming specifically to say these people should be recalled or should not be recalled and not going just to vote um, for the, the budget. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Paul Johnson, 78 Mitchell Hill Road. Um, I think the and I don't know if this is possible, but perhaps one solution to that would be that there is a distinct difference on June 12th uh, um, to vote for the budget and to vote for the recall. I don't know if that's possible. You could do different colored ballots. Um, you could do different colored tables. There's, there's ways to have people abstain from participating in the recall and to make it very clear that they don't have to participate in the recall. Um, I think also where, I, well, where we have found ourselves, it's because we've at some point, I think we all feel like we're moving at breakneck speed. And everybody's asked the question on both sides, where, how did we get here? And a lot of that has to do with timelines and speed, no matter what side you're on. And, and we all feel like we're getting hurled forward. And I think if we perpetuate that, we just keep setting ourselves up for a complete lack of finality. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a possibility as well, if you, if you, if you have the June 12th, that the town could actually take some time to reflect. There's been no time to reflect. Everybody's reacting, myself included, my group included, everybody that's on the other side included. So we, we haven't had that moment of, hey, let's just reflect on it. Let's think about it. Let me process what I heard tonight. Let everybody else process what they heard tonight and make the best decision. Thanks. Thank you.
Drew Stevens, 6 Surrey Lane. Uh, I would request that you do the vote on May 8th. Uh, number one, the seniors in high school, it's not just the three people involved in the recall, but the seniors in high school have a right to have their senior year. Um, and this should be over as soon as we can get it done. Um, number two, the cost doesn't make a difference. It's a separate paper ballot. It's going to be the same price whether you do it in May 8th or in June 12th. So that's not an issue. Um, number three, these three people are the ones that are the brunt of this. And we should be doing everything that we can do to get this over with so the town can move forward. There's no reason to wait around. If someone signed the petition, they knew what they were signing. We've heard left and right, up and down. People knew exactly what they were doing. Great, then they know when the vote is. We'll tell them when the vote is. There's no reason why we need to put this off for an additional four weeks. It just, it's just waiting around um, for no other reason than to get extra people into the voting booth, which we know they'll show up for the budget. Um, so May 8th, please. Hi, Andrea Byron, 3 Homer Sands Drive. Um, I'd just like to suggest if we want to take a breath and make sure that we have enough time for absentee votes, maybe we could schedule the vote in November. Because if it's important enough for us to be having this measure at all, it should be something that needs to be dealt with immediately. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, John Clutchy, or Clutchier, uh, 9 Mother Lane. <laughs> I, I like the November option, um, but I, I just wanted to say I think it's, it's crazy that the group that is pushing so hard to recall these three individuals for incompetence is advocating to s extend the deadline for when we vote and have a clear and decisive answer to whether they're incompetent uh, according to the electorate. And uh, so whether it's May 8, whenever, I think it, we deserve closure and clarity on this issue, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Doris Jackson, 18 First Street, um, June 12th, for all the reasons they've already stated, I made it Thank, thank you. Good evening, Kimberly Cornwall, 21 Hidden Creek Drive. I'm requesting May 12th or any time after May 8th to allow more time. Uh, obviously, as the reasons stated, um, a lot of people are not on social media uh, and do rely on the paper. <laughs> Uh, I also have two children at the high school, and I am in disagreement with uh, why we need, the person stated, uh, I have a senior, as to why we need to hurry up and have this done. My son's senior year has already been tainted. These seniors have already had their year, you know, crapped on, basically, um, because of the whole issue with Principal Creech um, and him having to leave. Um, Postponing it is not going to matter anymore. These kids are watching everything that's happening now. They're analyzing everything that's going on, and they can see how it's being rushed, how it's being handled. And you have to really ask yourself, are you really allowing enough time for the votes to come in, the absentees, and enough time for people to evaluate this and look at it? And like somebody else stated, there's a clear way to differentiate the two votes. If somebody wants to take a different colored paper and vote uh, for the recall or not, you know, by assuming your voters won't be looking at what they're doing and can't think for themselves is it's not fair to your voters. We're simply asking for more time to allow people to get the information and to evaluate. Um, that's all. Thank you. Jennifer Cleary, Meeting House Road. I would like to um, tell you that I'm in favor of a June 12th vote. Uh, we've heard the statistics on the absentee ballots. It is a very important part of our process in any referendum or um, election. Um, and given that I was a petition gatherer, I did hear from many college students who came out and signed the petitions um, and their parents that are concerned that they will not have enough time to get an absentee ballot to their student who will not be back from school. Whereas the majority of the students that have voiced their opinion in this controversy will be back by the June 12th date. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Joe Nelson, 23 Morning Street. Everything that Jen Cleary just said, ditto. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further comments? Two written comments? Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> All, I'm uh, from Sarah Mullen. All, I am unable to attend tonight but want to voice my support for holding the recall election vote as soon as possible. I think as a town we need to move on from this as quickly as possible regardless of the outcome. On a personal level, the board members in question need to be able to move on from this. And finally, given that the open question is whether the board members are competent, I think it is imperative that the town be given the chance to voice its opinion on that front sooner rather than later. If the collective wisdom of the town is that any or all of these women are incompetent, I see no benefit of letting them remain on the board for an additional month. Please keep the vote on May 8th. Thank you for your time and service to our town. From Kelly Farino. Town Councillors, I am writing to express my thoughts on the proposed dates of the recall election. I strongly believe that the date of May 8 is the best choice for this vote to be held. To be sure, this has been a long, challenging eight weeks for our community. We all deserve for this to be put behind us so we can move on productively and proactively. These community members subject to the recall have been scrutinized, criti critiqued, and talked about excessively. In fairness to them, the decision should be made swiftly. People on both sides of the discussion have known the election was coming. There has been ample time to prepare. In addition, families of high school students deserve to know that their children will head into the final few weeks of school and the final exam period with this distraction over. <coughs> high school seniors and their families get one chance at a high school graduation. Our fellow community members celebrating this milestone deserve to do that without this distraction. I hope you will consider these ideas and vote for a May 8, 2018 election. Thank you. I accept the motion. So moved. Second. Peter. I'd like to propose an amendment, a motion. Accept a motion to amend. The motion is I'd like to make a motion to amend the main motion to set the date, time, and location of the three recall election for the Board of Education for Tuesday, June 12, 2018 at 7 a.m. at the high school. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion to amend and a second. I'll recognize the maker of the motion. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we've kind of heard I, I think you know we've heard from the podium the different the different sort of arguments the only thing I'd like to point out a couple of things that were said is number one someone mentioned there is no cost to have separate elections I'll check with the through the assistant town manager I think there is definitely a cost to hold yeah. two different elections I think it's on a range of five to six thousand dollars is that I'm going to defer to Tody, Tody, if I may. Tody is prepared to uh, okay. answer, answer that question and uh, we talked about it earlier today uh, the, uh, the cost of the election uh, involves additional staffing time, but a significant reduction in the cost of balloting because the November 12th election is a machine ballot election where, uh, and requires a certain volume to be ordered. Uh, so there's a significant cost difference uh, between the two. And I must say, I learned this today, that we pay our staff who show up $9 an hour. So it's not, there isn't much in the way of uh, staffing costs. So, Tody, why don't you speak to this? However, it, if we were to have it on, no, or any time, and it was electronic, it could be up to about $5,000 because the ballots are 25 cents a piece. So if we held, <clears throat> held it in June, we'd do paper ballots but the cost is still where we're having it with the state. We have to match the number of ballots that are printed that the state gives us, which is about 10,000. So at this point, we'd have to do everything in-house. We have no control over the number of ballots that we have to print if we have it with a state. If we have it local, uh, separate, we can control the number of ballots that we print to mean that it would be cheaper to do um, the printing costs in-house. But there's still cost. So, I mean, that's, there is that still cost, yes. Okay. There's still then, cost. Quick, well, let me finish since but, you deferred to me first. Yeah. When, when Tody and I spoke earlier, if I understood Tody correctly, the additional cost accrued by staffing is equal to the additional cost in balloting. And in Tody's yeah. opinion, the, dip, the cost of holding the election on May 8 is no different than the cost of adding the election to June 12. It is cost neutral between the two dates. Right. Tody, is that correct? That's correct, because we're using paper ballots. Recognize 
Councillor Hayes to continue his remarks. Yeah, and, then, and then the second I would like to point out, again, I think this would, I'll defer it back to this, I think you had done some surveys. There was some comment made about um, people are fully informed with social media and other things, but I think you had done some work in interviews over the summer where a, a large percentage of people in Scarborough still, get, especially the seniors, get their information from the Scarborough leader. I think the number you used was 70% or so folks rely on the leader. So to assume that if the leader goes out Friday, that to assume that people are going to be have fully informed the voting date, that, that may be a factor. Is that fair? So um, I do not have a percentage of the people heard from with the leader. I'm sorry, Peter. I didn't come prepared to speak to a specific number. But you did, I thought you did reference that a significant number of people when you did the interviews at the library rely on the leader for information about things that are going on in town. I think we can say unequivocally that people rely on the leader for information. So, so, so for that, that if it doesn't come out Friday, that's just a factor. So then the other two other things I just like to kind of talk about is, is one, um, I do have a student in, 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 is a junior in the high school now. He's not distracted by the things that are going on, so I don't know how, how valid a point was that this is a significant issue for the students. He's not distracted by it. And I think that the last thing to think about is, um, based on all the other things that were said, but as we think about how we heal this community going forward, I think it's really, really important that we have a clear mandate from the voting public just on where they are. And I think if we don't get the voter turnout on the 8th, um, that's not going to be a clear mandate. So I think my suggestion is to move it to June 12th. And that's my rationale versus everything else that you've heard. Who would like to speak next? Oh, oh. So um, I just follow up on what, what Peter said. I, I, I think the uh, mandate argument though could, be, could potentially be argued the other way. Um, what I really see is that we've got two bad choices here. Um, May 8th is arguably too soon because it cuts down on potential for absentee balloting. Um, June 12th is arguably too late. It's an additional, it's eight weeks, seven, seven weeks from now. Um, and uh, as we heard tonight, you know, there's a, there's a large depth of uh, feeling in the community. There's uh, a lot of discord. Um, you, we could hear and see the impact that um, this is having on um, the individuals that are being recalled, their families, their friends, their neighbors, lots of members of the community. This is not about three people versus the whole community. This is about groups in the community that are, that are represented. I think one thing that I noticed that was really interesting about the emails that we received and the speakers tonight were that, you know, your feelings on this really came down to um, where you sat on the issue of recall in the first place. I think Ms. Uh, Giftos uh, mentioned that, you know, it was, it was obvious that as a supporter of the, um, of the um, recall initiative that, that she therefore was in favor of the later date. Um, and uh, I think that this has been going on for months um, and that we really need to bring this to a resolution. Um, uh, I think that we have, I believe that we're going to speak to some of the accommodations that we're trying to make in order to have uh, additional absentee voting. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that true? Okay. Um, and and I, I feel that so. Can we, can we speak to that now? Yeah, we, we can speak to that. Uh, the town clerk has offered to uh, uh, open up Saturday, all day, 9 to 3, uh, as an additional day. Saturdays are particularly good just because it's a weekend. Uh, and that was a, a, a very generous gesture on the part of the town clerk to give up her Saturday and her assistant. So we've been able to add one. There are uh, Fridays and Mondays uh, are, are available, but they're for people who are really absentee. Now, it isn't early voting. It's absentee voting. And the distinction is early voting, anybody can go in and, and do it. Absentee voting is you have to have special circumstances, special circumstances like you're out of state, if you were a student, for instance. 
And I did check on your question, and, and by legal, MMA said we would have to still adhere to the state law. Gotcha. So, to, so to be clear, the, the question was, could we could we make the not have it be absentee and have that, those two days be removed? So, uh, so which just the clarity? Which Saturday are we talking about? This Saturday. Though? If if it were to be on the eighth, it would be this. This, this Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. yeah. So, in addition to the the Scarborough Leader, you know, we're going to put signs out for, in front mm -hmm. of the uh, town hall. Um, I think that there's been a lot of attention that's, that has been made to this, and I, I think that you know we heard you know lots of enthusiasm for getting out the vote, um, and so I think we'll we'll um, you know I'm, I'm hoping that these accommodations are going to be enough. Councilor Foley. We're, we're in deliberation, so I can't recognize you at this point. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. I'm just confused. Are you saying that Scarborough doesn't have no reason after the fact that goes against the state law, correct? Yes, we do. Actually, it's absentee voting, but the Friday and the Monday prior to an election is called a special circumstance. In other words, you have to have a... a, a the Friday, just the Friday and the Monday. The Friday and the Monday, okay. Monday, the Friday and the Monday okay. prior. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Councilor yes. 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 Um. So we've, we've heard from a ton of people on this issue uh, on both sides, and both make really good arguments. Um, I want to say first and foremost that my thought process and my decision here tonight has nothing to do with the three individuals because I do feel like they have been tortured, their families have been put through hell, and it's rough. Uh, it's been rough on people on both sides though as well, and so I want to make the decision that I feel is the most thoughtful and uh, good for our town. I see um, a lot of people um, sometimes making decisions based on emotion, and that's not always uh, a great way to make that decision. And so um, if I had my druthers, we'd have an answer tonight, and they could move forward. Um, but this is the process that we have, and, and we have to kind of honor that and go through that. I also just want to briefly share uh, my other thinking around this. I, I know a little, little something about uh, running a petition in town. Some of you may recall um, the dancing dogs on the corner several years ago. Um, at times that was definitely me in the dog suit. Um, and uh, one of the things that has disheartened me ever since that experience was that how many times I've been told, Katie, the only people who showed up, the reason you won by 30 or 73 percent was because the only people who came out loved dogs. And so they were delegitimizing our efforts and what we worked really hard for because it was just a special election. And it was the largest special election in the town's history. I don't want that, I don't, at the end of the day, I don't care which side of this fence you're on, I don't want anybody to be able to look at each other and say, well, it didn't really count because. Uh, you only you, you rushed it, or it didn't really count because you, you know, I, I want the voice of the town to be, I can't imagine why having the most number of voters possible wouldn't give us the best true litmus test of what people feel like. So that's how I'm basing my decision on it. Again, it's got, it's no personal piece there. Um, I really think that combining the vote is better uh, because also the opportunity if people do act on emotion, and I had coffee with a gentleman this morning. Um, he told me to share his name. His name is Jack Roberts. He lives on Cranberry Pines Drive. Uh, he was leaning towards voting no, and because of the vote, he's now leaning towards voting yes. Uh, because of the change of date, he's concerned. Uh, and whether you follow his thinking or his logic, it doesn't really matter, because when somebody thinks or acts on emotion, um, they make bad decisions, and voters make bad decisions when they act on emotion. Uh, so anyway, those are my reasons for supporting the June 12th uh, combination, and I, I know, I, I think Councilor Rowan actually said it best, we have two bad choices here. Um, and maybe we should have looked at that, maybe we should have been looking at May 15th or May 22nd, um, but that's not the motion on the table, so. Um. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, I move Councilor Caterina. I move that we move the question. Uh, we can. Uh, that is without debate. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we will then pick up discussion on the main motion, whether the amendment passes or not. Uh, so this will not cut off uh, debate as to the main motion. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we are voting on a motion to amend to uh, substitute for May 8th the date of June 12th. Uh, all in favor? All opposed? Uh, main motion. Uh, who would like to speak to the main motion? Councilor Katerina. Yeah, I, I have some prepared remarks because uh, any of you who have emailed me have known that I've debated this with myself now for quite a while since we started talking about when we are going to have the date. So bear with me. I have very quick prepared remarks because at 11, 10 at night, I'm not responsible for what may come out of my mouth if it's not prepared. So. Uh, I'm very sorry to see the people of Scarborough torn apart by the issues that have come before us. Uh, whatever I may believe personally, my job as town councilor requires that I put all of that aside and vote tonight on which date will be used for the recall election, May 8th or June 12th. That is our only decision tonight. I have heard from many people on both sides of this issue of setting the date. I think that both sides make very valid arguments. However, as a leader in this town, I need to form my own informed decision based on my own homework. Towards that end, I have asked questions of the town attorney through the chair and the town manager. I talked personally to Secretary of State Matt Dunlap. I talked to members of the Road to Renewal. I have talked to members of Sharing Truth uh, um, of Recall Matters. I have talked to family members of the persons who are being recalled. I've read all emails and tried to respond to all of them, and I apologize if for some reason I missed your email. I have been stopped in Hannaford's, and I feel I have taken the time and the effort to make an informed opinion. The issues I have weighed are following. One, the, issue, the effect of conflating this particular issue with party primary voting and the first vote of the school budget. Two whether or not the people of Scarborough have sufficient information in order to cast an informed vote. Three, will a longer time frame, i.e. holding the vote on June 12th, exacerbate or relieve the incredible tension among the factions in town? Four, what effect is this process having not only on the persons being recalled, but on their spouses mm -hmm. and children? And five, is there adequate time for absentee ballots to be requested, mailed, and returned? These are my conclusions. One, I do want to keep this vote separate due to both its unique nature and the potential impact upon ballot issues which are already teed up for June 12th. Several speakers have mentioned um, the, those factors, so I'm not going to go over them again. Under state statute, if that applied in this case, which it doesn't, which I made clear with Mr. Dunlap, the clock on time frame set, setting votes for recall start at certification. Certification, not a recall hearing. Given that this issue made the front page of the Sunday Telegram and has had, had extensive media coverage, including national coverage, since the inception of the recall effort this winter, I find it hard to believe that the citizens of Scarborough are not informed. In fact, there was a posting on the Road to Renewal Facebook site on April 22nd, 2018 that states, and I quote, all the press coverage that the school board recall is getting should help in making people aware of the issue, especially the non-Facebook folks who will be pivotal in getting to the 3,147 votes required, end quote. Three, the chair of the finance committee as well as others, have expressed in emails their desire to not conflate this issue with the budget process and to move it forward as quickly as possible in the name of returning civility to this town. There is much to be said to support this. Four, the families of those subject to recall have expressed concern about the emotional and physical toll this matter has taken on their families. Some have even expressed concern for their own safety following the revelation of actions taken by those who we all agree have gotten unduly incensed by the situation, and I'm being nice about that. Five, finally, actions are being taken to ensure that all those wishing to vote absentee can do so. And um, Tody has addressed some of that. I've also clarified, family members, you can go and pick up an absentee ballot for another family member, if you wish. And there's a form for that, and you can sign up. 
You can request absentee ballots via email. I had a constituent from Florida ask me how can she get it quickly. I said email it. Uh, do whatever information Todi asks you to do on the email and request that it be sent directly to your Florida address, not to your Scarborough address, so it doesn't have to go through forwarding because mail forwarding can be an issue. So, in conclusion, having weighed all of those factors, pro and con, yes and no, I will do support May 8th as the date for the recall. The factors that weighed most heavily with me were the desire to bring a resolution to this matter to those facing the recall vote and a desire to not conflate this issue with issues on the regular ballot on June 12th. I, and as I mentioned um, about ballots and Saturday, Saturday early balloting day, um, I believe that those requiring absentee options are not being shut out. We're doing everything we can to make sure people can vote. I do encourage people with an interest in both sides of the issue to turn out and vote. It's your right and it's your responsibility. So th th those are my comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Com comments at this end? Sean? A um, couple of uh, things. Uh, one is uh, some, um, somewhat of a personal perspective and then a historical one. Um, so. Uh, during a couple of the breaks, uh, someone mentioned, you know, um, they thought for sure that with having the podium here, my face would not be shown. I guess my face has been all over the TV. And a uh, few people have mentioned my face is so red, am I okay? I, I, I actually literally just got off a plane at about 5.30 uh, from being down in Florida. Um, and so this is a suntan. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not having high blood pressure issues. Um, but I'm glad to be here. Um, but the irony of the, the funny part of that story is that um, when I was down there for my wife's uh, company uh, function, yeah. I literally walked into a hotel resort, and I hear across the floor by the registration desk, are you Sean Babine? I'm like, yes. I'm like, weird place to be recognized, but I'm okay. And they said, you're on the town council, aren't you? What on earth is going on with the school department? <laughs> I'm in Florida, and I'm getting questions about the town council, the school board, and what is going on. So the fact is that while we might think we live in a very small world and it's only Scarborough, it's, very, it's much, much bigger and we are being watched um, by the decisions and the conversations that we have. Um, the historical piece is that I think that people need to bring into perspective the recall process and how it changed. In 2010, there was a charter commission that was approved by the council. Those nine members met, um, reviewed the entire charter and actually changed what was in a way already a recall provision in the, in the charter that said basically the only way in which a counselor um, or a school board member could actually be removed from office was actually if they were jailed for at least six months or greater. That was the only provision in which someone could be removed. Um, and I think that that was the intent of the founding fathers and the founding um, people of this town. But then it changed in 2010 in which um, we have now are into this kind of uh, direction. So I did go and look at the charter and said, you know, how can I interpret that? And I think that there is a very significant clause within that that says very clearly that we have a responsibility to be fair and equitable in the due process of this process. And that fairness is allowing what happened tonight, which is actually very specific and said how we were to handle it, that we had to allow the three school board members to defend themselves. We had to allow for a public hearing in which um, comments then could be offset. And that part of that due process that to me is inherent within the definition is also um, a quick trial. We expect that in every other situation in which we are being judged. Guarantee is more, more common with a legal kind of a uh, process, but in essence, this is, um, this is that. And the fact is that we really shouldn't be referencing this as a road to renewal. We should be talking about a road to healing. And in order for this town to heal, we need to come to a decision. This needs to be resolved sooner than faster, and I'm very happy with the May 8th date um, as being that date. This needs to be resolved. Thank you. Further comment, um, uh, Councilor Mellon, or are you a say? No, I think I, I think I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilor Chiesa was out of town on business, but he did ask me to read a statement. Uh, uh, Chairman Donovan, fellow councilors and members of the general public, first allow me to express, and I might say, he really wanted to have his view on this known, but his vote doesn't count. Uh, only the people who are present uh, counts. 
First, allow me to express my regrets at not being present in chambers this evening. My job sometimes requires travel outside the state, and while my employer is very understanding with my scheduling business trips around council obligations, this instance was unavoidable, could not be rescheduled. <clears throat> Since I cannot vote on the date of the recall election, I will keep my remarks brief. I support holding the recall election on May 8th. The recall of an elected official who was voted into office with a majority of the vote and through a lengthy and certified election process is one of the most serious actions that can be undertaken in a democracy. It essentially invalidates the will of the majority of voters who elected the individual in the first place. This is, in part, why at the state and federal level, the process has clearly defined criteria for initiation and is typically reserved as a last response to convicted crimes, or if a very high level of inca inca incapacitation can be shown. These criteria of standards are not present in our town charter. That absence, however, does not diminish the gravity of undertaking such an action. Because the outcome of a recall is uh, to invalidate the initial will of the people, the process by design is meant to be cumbersome and independent of other actions. There is a high threshold of signatures required to initiate the process, as well as a fixed level of voter participation required in order to ensure that the true will of the majority of people is being undertaken. Because the signature and voter thresholds are an integral check and balance on the recall process, I believe the recall initiative needs to stand on its own merits in order to be fully valid. The town attorney <clears throat> as well as the Secretary of State, have confirmed we are within our authority as a council to set the voting date of May 8th. And I feel that if we are going to overturn the democratic election process, we have held sacred for over 200 years, we have a sworn obligation to ensure the recall process stands or fails on its own merits. Uh, in the agenda packet, I did a memo because I wanted people to know uh, why I was putting forward a proposal of May 8. Uh, uh, I really won't repeat that because many of the remarks that you've heard here tonight are, are uh, stated in that memo. <clears throat> I will say that I think everyone in Maine knows about this. Uh, uh, it's, it's extraordinary, the publicity it's gotten. Uh, I, I made an effort uh, last week to uh, make sure that the agenda uh, was uh, published. It said May 8. The uh, press, the leader, carried a reference, I believe, to uh, May 8th. Uh, and it's obvious to me that our charter is different from the state charter for a reason. You can have any reason that you can seek to recall a public official. At the state of Maine level, it's got to be a crime that actually adversely impacts the municipality itself. But they don't have a 30% requirement. We have a no holds barred, anything you want to do, but we have a 30% requirement to make sure that it is of such seriousness that people want to come out. Uh, it, we would be doing a disservice to the community, uh, essentially putting our thumb on the scale if we married this election with June 12th, because it wouldn't be a true indication of the seriousness with which this community takes these charges. Uh, I expect 3,194, I think is the number I calculated, uh, people will come out. But uh, uh, I do believe that that's, that's an important element here. Uh, and to pick June 12th would be to undermine what the Charter Commission actually intended by that condition. So, uh, any further questions? We're voting on the main motion. Uh, no amendments to it. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Passes. I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. We are adjourned. That was fast. <coughs>